Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Another special night of ours. For those who don't know me, uh, my name's Chris Icono, and I'm the chairman of COASET, Italian Family History Group. Tonight, we are delighted to have the Honourable Anthony Albanese as our guest speaker to tell us his remarkable Italian family story. And it is really, I think a lot of people probably know it already, but thank you for staying. Uh, but uh, the ones that don't know, I think will be very impressed. Uh, before that happens, there's a couple of things I need to tell you. Firstly, I wish to acknowledge that we are meeting on traditional Aboriginal land, and I acknowledge Elders past and present. Secondly, I'd like to thank our asset board for supporting the work that we do and acknowledge the board members who uh, are always here to help us. Tonight we have our co-asset manager, Thomas Compriale, which is somewhere here. Here he is here. And he's going to say a few words in, at the moment. Um, the event is being filmed tonight. The film will be edited and uploaded to the Italian Family History Group website and YouTube channel. If you do not wish to be filmed, Please move to the back of the auditorium and Jim will not film you. But I think everyone should take advantage of the next. <laughs> Thank you everyone. Now I would like to uh, welcome Thomas to come and say a few words about the coming 50th anniversary of Coasset. Uh, Thomas, would like to say a few Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Board of Directors of COASA, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to the Italian uh, Cultural Centre. I would like to acknowledge that we're here tonight on Aboriginal land, and on behalf of COASA, I pay my respects and show my respects to the traditional custodians of the land and the present Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who now reside within this area. A special welcome as well uh, to our special guest uh, this evening, the Honourable Anthony Albanese. I'm very much looking forward to his address tonight at the COASA Italian Family History Group. I'm also very much looking forward to involving many of you in the celebrations planned for 2018 when we mark a significant milestone in the history of COASA. As Chris has mentioned, next year we will be celebrating 50 years of provision of services, community and language services, and the promotion of the Italian language and culture in New South Wales. So it's a very big uh, deal for us. We are planning a number of events and activities throughout the year to celebrate the role of the organisation and the remarkable contribution of the many people in the community, as well as all the staff and volunteers involved in so many different levels of the organisation <coughs> over five decades. As many of you would know, Kaiser was established in 1968 in Sydney to promote the Italian language and culture. A research project is now underway to try and capture some of the most important memories and moments of the past 50 years particularly the many moving stories of Italian migration to Australia. We're working on a documentary film uh, to share these stories, and I'd like to now play for you a little teaser of this project. In the 50s and 60s, many Italians came to Australia to escape the ravages of World War II. Arriving with little more than what they had in their hands, they went on to build a life and a community that contributed a great deal to New South Wales across a diversity of areas. This is their story, an Italian story. When I arrived, I, I thought I was in paradise, honestly. Uh, when I went under the bridge and I saw these beautiful surroundings, it was just incredible. I came here to Australia in 1957, I was uh, nine years old. We were all anxious when that morning that we arrived in Sydney. Um, we were all out early and, uh, and all the coastline around the heads and that is was all rocky and no houses and no stones. I don't remember seeing any houses. In 2018, Kaiser will be celebrating 50 years of service to the Italian and wider community in New South Wales. To mark this special occasion, we are documenting the lives and contributions that our community has made. From parts of this historic archive, we'd like to produce a documentary 
for at least to coincide with our anniversary. We are looking to document as many stories as possible. This could include your story, your parents' story, or your grandparents' story. When we docked, we docked at Woolamaloo. Uh, lots of people waiting down there, including my father waiting for us. We went to the uh, uh, sugar cane at uh, Innisfail, but uh, it was very hard work, uh, that uh, sugar cane cutting in those days. So we, then we decided to uh, come down to Sydney and went to work on the uh, Snowy Mountain Scheme. Hi, I'm Al Ellis, producer of this project, and I'm very excited to be a part of it. The Italian story post-World War II in Australia is a fascinating and inspiring one. Documenting it is very important, not only for future Italian generations, but for every Australian. We'd like you to take part. Building takes around an hour, and it's a friendly, low-key process. So if you have a story you would like to tell, and like to be a part of this project, please click on the link below. I look forward to meeting you. We'd like you to be a part of this project. You can give us a call, send us an email, or find us online. Uh, before I conclude, uh, I'd like to inform you that Kaiser has launched the second edition of the Spring Summer Festival, uh, which will be held here at the Italian Forum. And starting this coming Sunday, September 24, we'll be hosting a range of family-friendly uh, events. Uh, this will include a visit from the Minions, the Smurfs, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and um, Bananas in Pyjamas in time for Christmas. So uh, that will include live music, magic, face painting, and much, much more. So last year's festival attracted hundreds of families to the piazza over the course of the festival uh, to enjoy entertainment activities for kids and people of all ages. So we're building on the success of this and um, we ask you to uh, spread the word, come down and enjoy us. Apparently it's going to be 29 degrees on Sunday, so a lovely day to come and spend with us here at the Forum. And there will be some uh, flyers at the desk for you to take home or by all means give them, uh, take a bunch and give them out to your family and friends. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. How 50 years has gone so quickly. Uh, just a, a little side thing here. Tonight in the audience is my sister and my brother-in-law, who's not here tonight, and they were the original directors of Coasset when it was formed back in the early days. My brother-in-law was the treasurer for quite a few years. So it's a family business. <laughs> Well, with, without further ado, I'd like Anthony to come up and uh, tell us Well, thanks, um, thanks very much, Chris. And I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country and pay my respect to their elders past and present. And can I say um, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming along and thank you to Coasset and the Italian Family History Group uh, for organising uh, this evening. Um, my story is, uh, is one I'm sure, well, I, I hope with a difference, and uh, one that you will find interesting. And part of, uh, I guess, uh, telling my story when I decided to go public with it uh, just a few years ago was uh, that uh, Karen Middleton, who wrote the uh, biography, uh, that is there, had, um, was aware of uh, my personal story and had harassed me to write a book. She said it's important uh, that uh, this story uh, be told. And uh, it was one that I resisted for um, a long period of time because it is a difficult story, um, but it's one that I thought was important uh, to give uh, due respect uh, to uh, my mother in particular for what she had gone through, a very tough beginning, but also to show, I guess, that uh, families are very complex. And uh, growing up uh, in Camperdown, uh, where uh, I was uh, born just down the road here in Piedmont Bridge Road, of course, uh, I uh, went to St Joseph's, uh, school there at, uh, at Camperdown, now it's a childcare centre uh, on the corner of Parramatta Road and, uh, and Missenden Road there. And so I had a lot to do 
with Leichhardt in particular, growing up as a young kid. And I grew up with uh, just uh, my mother uh, and originally my grandparents as well, uh, right opposite the Children's Hospital there in uh, Pier Mockbridge Road. And at that time, uh, it was City Council housing and then it became Housing Department. Uh, my mother was born in that house in 1936. My grandparents moved in there in, in 1927. And at that time, there was some prestige for living on a main road. So they, they were the original inhabitants and they could have had any of the houses. There's a back street as well, there's two uh, rows of houses, uh, they chose to be in the middle of the first row there, about where the lights are, number number 41, Piermont Bridge Road. Uh, growing up, uh, there was just myself and my mother. I knew I had this name. That wasn't Smith or Brown, it was, uh, as uh, my mother pronounced it, Albanese, uh, as uh, you would know, Albanese. And uh, I knew, therefore, that I had uh, the Italian heritage and I, I knew I was half Italian. And it's funny that uh, I, I always felt that um, in a way that I think a lot of times people's feelings is hard to uh, rationalise. But I certainly knew I was essentially half Irish, half Italian, which of course made me 100% Catholic. <laughs> and, and so, of that I was sure. <laughs> of that I was absolutely sure. But um, growing up, um, I uh, grew up with three great faiths, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, the Australian Labor Party, and uh, South Sydney Rugby League Football Club. <laughs> and they were, were what was entrenched in my family. Uh, and uh, never to deviate from, uh, from any of those. Um, as I got a, a little bit older, as you do, uh, you notice uh, that my father wasn't around. Um, I was told that, uh, that, he was, uh, that he died in a car accident uh, before I was born. And I, I thought that, I guess, the, the old story, you don't know what you've got if you've never had it, um, so that didn't worry me particularly, but as I got uh, a little bit older, into my teens, uh, you very much start to ask questions and wonder, want to know a little bit more. When I was old enough, uh, my mother uh, felt that I was mature enough to know uh, the real story, which was that she had uh, travelled overseas, like a lot of uh, young Australians, uh, she travelled uh, then, of course, by, by boat on, on the, the Fair Sky, on the Sitmar Line, had travelled uh, to Europe. And uh, on uh, that trip, uh, she met uh, Carlo Albanese, uh, my father, and uh, had a relationship with him uh, that extended to uh, the time when she was living in London. And I had come about uh, as a result of uh, that relationship. Uh, she had had a discussion with him about, uh, about that. Uh, he was, at the time, uh, betrothed uh, to someone from uh, his, uh, his town uh, in Italy. Uh, so she chose uh, to come home uh, to have me. At that time, of course, uh, uh, we know the stories of uh, young women uh, going to the country for six months and coming back in order to, I guess, preserve the um, respect for the family. And my, my family were um, very Catholic and uh, my mother, because she lived with uh, her grandparents, uh, the story was told that uh, uh, she had, uh, I was due to be potentially adopted, adopted out, which is what was very common at that period of history in the 1960s. Um, so the story was to be told that uh, her husband, 
uh, had uh, died in the car accident and the trauma had caused her to lose her child. Um, all very neat uh, to tell a story to the family in Camperdown and in Camperdown in those days, of course, everyone knew everything. <laughs> At the time, of course, uh, working class people um, sometimes know a lot more than they let on, and I suspect that they probably knew the neighbours, you know, that, they, that the story wasn't quite as neat as that. In any case, the nuns at uh, St Margaret's at, at Darlinghurst uh, knew uh, my mother, and there, there may well be some people here who knew my mother. She was very much uh, uh, a local for a long period of time, for her whole life she lived in that house. Born there, died there, 65 years later. Um, uh, the nun did what uh, uh, people weren't allowed to do, which was to bring the child in to show the mother. And of course, once my mother saw me, as she said to me, she wasn't about to let me go. So she made the, uh, the difficult and I think very courageous decision uh, to raise me by herself. And she did that, and uh, so when... Uh, she told me when I was about 14 or 15, uh, over, the, uh, over the kitchen table one night, uh, she told me there was something serious she had to tell me uh, about. Um, I, my response was uh, very uh, much, I think, reflected uh, what, uh, what my character was of, at that time. And I think, um, I think it's one of the things that's put me in good stead in politics is that um, I'm very much uh, can stand alone sometimes uh, against, uh, against the odds. Uh, growing up in a two-person family with a single mum does tend to toughen you up. And she had, my mother had uh, rheumatoid arthritis very badly. She was always, she was always uh, very sick from the time she was quite young. Uh, she died at 65. And uh, when people ask me what she died of, I, I say essentially she was spent. Uh, she was just she was just done. Um, uh, she had had a very tough life, uh, but uh, she never complained about anything at all. So she um, she told me, and and I told her as well what I thought at the time, but also I think what she needed to hear, which was that. I didn't need to find my father. I knew I was half Italian and that was good enough. Um, but I think she needed to hear that she was all that I needed. But as I got older, um, you particularly when, uh, as well, if you're in public life, uh, people would say to me, uh, where, is, where is your father from? And I thought at the time, uh, because uh, the ship was based in Naples for quite a while. I thought he was probably from Naples. Um, and so I would sometimes say that, but it was, you know, you can't say uh, in a meeting as you're walking in, I greeted a number of you tonight as I was walking in, to a question like, where, where is your father from? You can't say, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that would get a rather strange response, I think. Uh, so, um, I became more and more in a, uh, I think, family and genetics is a strange thing. I developed a need to, to find him, uh, to know about, I wanted to know about my own, own history. One of the benefits of uh, being elected to Grainlow in 1996 is uh, that I, I met so many members of uh, the Italian community as well, um, both obviously in the Labor Party, but also people who I regard as a, uh, friends, like, like Phil Montrone, I regard as a friend, um, on the other side of politics, but people that we have a relationship with. And uh, I, I, I became involved with organisations, uh, had contact with COASIT, with PhilF, with all these organisations in the Italian community. Um, so, um, I, I 
tried to uh, ask my mother a little bit more, but it was, it was a bit difficult for her, which is as understandable. Then uh, my son came along in 2000, and uh, when he came along, that of course changes your life. Uh, my mother uh, passed away in 2002, and then I thought um, I could uh, search without any potential embarrassment to her or without her thinking somehow that I was, that she wasn't enough for me as, as a parent and I wanted to respect her legacy. Um, so uh, there was a particular time, I talk about this uh, in, uh, in the book, um, where I went to uh, the cemetery at, at Rookwood to visit the, the Catholic Lawn Cemetery there that uh, I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with. Um, and there I uh, was there with Nathan, would have been five or six. And he said to me, um, you know, where's your daddy, daddy? And it struck me that I had a real responsibility to him as well, uh, who had the name and the genes, uh, to know more about my family. So we went about uh, finding out what we could. Uh, now um, retired, but then Senator John Faulkner is a bit of an expert on the archives. Uh, and we found the ship entries of when the ship, the migration entries into and out of Australia. That meant that we found the date of, of his birth. Um, we then um, uh, went about trying to find our information through the Italian Embassy here, through the Australian Embassy. Uh, Amanda Vanstone was the ambassador. Um, she was uh, very helpful. I, I think uh, she rang most people uh, with what is not, as you'd be aware, an uncommon surname throughout Italy, um, trying to provide some assistance because she was determined uh, to, uh, to provide uh, some help. Um, in the end, um, I won't tell you all of the story because then you won't buy Karen's book <laughs> um, and then I'll be in trouble. But in the end, it was incredibly lucky. A, a, a maritime historian uh, who uh, lived uh, in Wollongong provided some assistance. We had, uh, as the uh, the, the transport minister, I got to know people in the, the maritime uh, sector and uh, there was one day when I, I asked to see the head of uh, the P&O cruises or Carnival Cruises uh, because Sitmar had been taken over by P&O which had been taken over by Carnival and uh, the head of Carnival Cruises lives in Balmain. And uh, I asked to see, uh, see her and I, I told her the story and said, you know, do you think there's any chance there might be some records there? Um, she knew this historian uh, who was, you know, a volunteer. He, did, he wasn't, didn't work for anyone. He was just fascinated by this. And, and he knew someone else who happened to go to uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, there was a, a shed that had uh, a whole lot of records in it in North Italy and in, in Genoa. Uh, and uh, in it they found a box and in that box were the employment records. And in that box, this is a one in you know, many million chance that in alphabetical order up pops this name uh, with a birth date that fitted with an address. And uh, he had, because of super arrangements and those things, there'd been some ongoing contact uh, long after he had, uh, he had retired. And that was then conveyed to me. 
uh, I was sitting in uh, my ministerial office in Phillip Street and I was about to chair a transport ministerial council meeting. Ministers from all of the states had come. We had a, a dinner on at the Hilton. And uh, the phone rang and uh, the words were, we're founding. Uh, and it was completely overwhelming because I had tried for a number of years and the fact that a volunteer knew another volunteer um, who was, you know, a, a, an Australian volunteer knew an, a, a British maritime historian um, who had gone to the effort of finding this box in uh, a wharf in Genoa is just beyond belief that that, that occurred. Uh, but I think it was meant to be. Um, at that time, I had uh, scheduled a meeting with, I'd been negotiating with uh, the European Minister for Transport at the time, uh, Minister Tajani, was uh, based in, in Rome. And we'd had meetings in Brussels and in, uh, in Leipzig in Germany. We were ready to sign an agreement and I was due to go uh, to Rome in, uh, in December. This was in November that I had found uh, this out. So I was due to go to Rome and, and to London to the International Maritime Organisation Assembly. Um, so uh, off I went um, and at the time there was a very short time frame and I had uh, someone who worked uh, at, the, uh, at the embassy, uh, wrote, uh, tried ringing this number, and uh, they thought, of course, you know, they didn't know whether it was a scam or what was going on, this strange call. Um, uh, in the end, we sent a registered letter to them to the family in, uh, in what we then knew was uh, Barletta in, in Puglia. Um, amazingly, just down the road from Thomas in Giovinazzo, just down the road from Trani. Um, incredible. And here we are in Leichhardt, which has a sister city, of course, with Giovinazzo, which is literally the distance from here to Petersham away, like literally that far away. Um, with a bit of industry in between. Um, and so um, we contacted what I now know was, uh, was a, a middle person because they weren't sure what was going on. Uh, someone in, uh, who was a, a friend, who was a, a, a lawyer, um, offered to see us in this town. We said we're going to, uh, going to be there um, on this one day, and it was the only day that we had. Uh, so I sat um, in this office and uh, we were there for just the weekend. I'd flown into uh, Italy on the, I'd got there on the Saturday, so this was Saturday afternoon. I only had, because of the meetings and the schedule, I only had that week, that weekend, the, the Saturday and the Sunday. Um, I had some meetings scheduled in, in Bari as well, at the, looking at the port. And we went to uh, have this meeting and immediately what I did was I put, um, we didn't say what, what it was for either. Uh, we said that in the letter that we carefully uh, wrote, um, we wrote that, uh, uh, Mary Ellery, we understand that you knew Mary Ellery, her son, the late Mary Ellery, my, my mother's uh, name. Um, we understand that uh, you knew her and her son will be visiting the area um, and it would it be possible to meet. Um, so I sat uh, in, the, in the office with a folder with my business card on it. Um, I wore my best suit. Um, to show that I wasn't after money or anything. Uh, this wasn't uh, anything untoward. But I, I put the folder deliberately 
facing her because they didn't know my surname. So as we're talking, I could see her looking at um, the card with my surname on it. And I told her the story and said, I think uh, this man, Carlo, uh, is my father and I would just like to meet him. Um, and we talked it through, why haven't you searched before? And I said, we found out about two weeks ago <laughs> and I was on my way to Rome. Um, and I had, from that point on, I had a real, uh, absolutely but difficult to describe, I had an absolute physical need. I would have gone and knocked on the door if they'd have said no. Um, I just had to see it, um, see it through. Um, they had, I think, quite understandable defences. They said, uh, Carlo isn't well, he mightn't be able to see you. Um, the phone kept ringing, <laughs> she kept sort of saying, we'll ring him back, and hanging up. We organised in the end to meet um, the next morning, um, and the next morning uh, I wasn't sure that it would happen, but I went to the office at the time, and in walked, um, there's a photo up there of our first, the photo of myself and my father is our first, that is our first uh, meeting um, on uh, the next day. Um, when uh, he walked in, and in walked my brother, my half-brother, and my half-sister as well. So, of the four closest blood relatives I had on the planet, I was meeting three of them for the first time. Um, and uh, they were meeting me for the first time as well. And uh, two of them didn't know I existed before that time. <laughs> um, and it was, um, he was incredibly generous um, uh, of spirit. Uh, he walked in the room, I had no idea what to expect. I, I don't have to go through with you what the options are. Uh, there are many. Um, the best option was he walked in and just opened his arms. Um, and uh, it, was a, uh, it was a very generous thing to do. Um, and uh, we had, uh, 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 unfortunately, not as long as I would have liked, about uh, uh, two hours, and then I promised to come back as soon as I could, which was as the minister in what was a very busy government in a crazy time, uh, I came back and brought his grandson uh, back to see him. That photo is our first visit. I think that's a, uh, a calendar that might have been called as a calendar <laughs> that I brought him of, of Italians in Australia. And I brought, I brought an, entire, an entire suitcase of, you know, all, all my nieces and nephews got, you know, kangaroos, all the usual things, but I brought him um, various historical things. Um, and uh, we met uh, in, in, in Easter. Um, at that time, in the traditional uh, Italian way that I don't have to tell you about, um, the family were... Uh, very generous. Um, we had, uh, they lived in uh, a unit, high rise in Valletta, um, and of course uh, you would go for for lunch with the entire extended family. I have a uh, brother, a sister, each of them have, uh, have two children each, so uh, three nieces and a nephew. Everyone was at every meal. <laughs> Um, uh, Carlo's wife uh, was very understanding of the circumstances. Um, I have tried to provide some protection for the broader family, as in the book and everything you'll see, just photos of Carlo, not of, of, of them. Um, and he, uh, he was somewhat surprised that this person across the other side of the world could be... Uh, become Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. Um, and uh, they were very, um, they were surprised by my taking on the name, his surname. That was something that my mother did uh, out of the respect way. 
but also something that uh, I'm very pleased that she did as well in terms of uh, my uh, lineage. Um, we had a, uh, I spent all of Easter uh, there. Uh, we visited uh, Trani uh, down the road uh, for, uh, it's a fantastic place around the port and the cathedral uh, there. Um, we, uh, they have a share house um, that uh, they all put in money for, a group of families uh, in uh, the countryside, uh, in the middle of vineyards. Um, it's an extraordinary area, many of you I'm sure are Pugliese, um, but it's uh, the food, the wine, um, uh, everything about, uh, about the culture there. Um, so we would have uh, very long dinners, um, lunches that, that go for a very long time. Um, and I was able to go back there then. My wife was a minister in the New South Wales government at the time, Kamal Tebbit. They were doing health reforms. She couldn't go. Uh, so we all went back as a family uh, the next year uh, in, uh, in June uh, for uh, an extended uh, time as well. And then we went there again as a family. So uh, Nathan uh, has had the benefit of uh, going there three times and my, my wife a couple of times. And uh, my father um, passed away in uh, January of uh, 2014. So during the election campaign in 2013, he was, he was very sick and I wasn't sure when I stood for the leadership of the, the, the party, um, part of my consideration was I wasn't sure if at some time I'd have to uh, travel back uh, at short notice. Um, I went back to say goodbye to him in uh, December 2013. And uh, he, was a, uh, he was at home. By then he'd gone home uh, uh, treatment wasn't going to be possible um, and we had a, a, a very uh, uh, difficult but a, a, a nice and respectful um, discussion uh, between, uh, be, between us where um, he, uh, you know, we basically said we were very glad that we found each other and that uh, that missing peace in my life was filled, um, which, was, uh, which is so important, I think, for people to know uh, where they come from and to have uh, that, uh, that family uh, connection. Uh, I went back uh, in uh, January of, uh, of last year, on the two-year anniversary of his death, to pay my respect to uh, at, uh, at the cemetery at, uh, at Valletta um, and uh, to see uh, the family to make sure that they knew that I wanted to have uh, that ongoing contact. Uh, I must say that new technology can be annoying but it can help with lots of things. Uh, WhatsApp is a great communication device that also translates of course as well uh, and uh, so uh, we, we communicate with members of my family there as late as uh, Saturday where I was at the, uh, the, the Puglia uh, offices just down in Ramwick Street and I, I sent them a photo saying I was here in Leichhardt with the Pugliese flag and everything behind us as well, that, that field talk. Um, so it, uh, I, I think my... Uh, Part of uh, the Italian story is, um, is unusual, to say the least, uh, but it's very much uh, a part of, I think, um, the fact that life is very complex. Families are complex, and uh, I respect uh, where, people, um, where people come from, but I, I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, I've been able to make that connection uh, with uh, my Italian family. Uh, most of my blood relatives are in Italy, not here, um, even though I've only met them uh, very recently. And I think it's very important um, for my son as well 
that he uh, has that contact. Uh, there is, it's interesting the way that genes uh, can change. When we first went across, um, he's 10 years old there. Um, and uh, that would make sense for the 40th an anniversary. Um, you know, it was a while ago that I would have had that. Um, and he, um, uh, you know, he has that um, connection there. He's, uh, his cousin at the time had, was a girl. Um, um, they look like the genes. It's unbelievable. They could be brother or sister, even though they live on different parts, uh, parts of the world. Um, so that, uh, that really has, uh, has shone through. So thank you for letting me share my story with you. Anyone would like to ask uh, Anthony any questions? We have a roving mic here. If you put up your hand, we'll bring it to you. Hi, thank you very much for that uh, lovely story. Uh, I just wanted to know how did you communicate with your father? How's your language, Italian language? Or, um, do you have a translator? The, uh, well, over a period of time, I have got better at, at understanding more than I could speak. Um, he also would, it's language, as we know from um, the aged care issue, older people can go back to the language that they spoke, and he would have spoken, he, he spoke English, obviously very fluently, uh, when he was working on the ship as as a person dealing with clients sort of the international language. Um, so there were times where you would get absolutely fluent English from him, would just come out. Um, and there are times where, where that wasn't the case, but we had some assistance from, from someone from, uh, who was a, a relative who understood both, Leonida, who's um, the woman who was the uh, intermediary, um, could assist. Uh, my brother spoke a little bit as well. Um, so we, we managed, and uh, it, it, my son also was learning, thank goodness, uh, Italian at Dulwich Hill Public School. <laughs> so that helps. Uh, so uh, uh, unfortunately, they dropped Italian at Leichhardt High School. Can you believe that? Anyway. Um, most tragically, uh, most annoyingly, from uh, from my perspective. But um, so we managed, um, and it's amazing how you can communicate all sorts of things with. Uh, it's amazing kids. I mean, one of the great successes of multiculturalism, of course, when you go into a school, you see kids just dealing with each other, regardless of race and religion or anything else. They just do it. Nathan and his, his cousins just seeing them um, play together. In between Baletta and Trani, I bet you Phil knows where it is, um, there's a service station and a restaurant on top. My father was the maitre d' at that restaurant for many, many years. Um, after he retired from the ships, he worked as a janitor at school during the day and worked at night. So, typical hard-working uh, person um, and uh, using those skills. And the kids were just running around outside, like they just got on incredibly well. Um, so, we, we managed. Thank you, my name, my name is Maria. Thank you for that. Uh, I just want to ask you, when you um, prior to finding out from your mother, did you ever have an inkling from her that something was missing or something was a little bit different or nothing? No, not at all. No as, sadness in her eyes or anything? As, as, you know, an adult, I look back and think, why were there no photos of my father in the house? And a range of things like that. There should have been a signal that maybe all wasn't as it seems. But at the time, if, if someone isn't there, you don't notice that they've gone because they've never been there. My mother was one of those um, 
women, sometimes it is men, but usually it's women who, who lived their lives through, very much through their children. I mean, she was totally um, devoted uh, to, to me, notwithstanding the fact that she had, you know, some difficulties with her health, you know, we didn't we didn't have a lot of money to say the least, um, but you know we didn't want for anything either. So it was just that, that was just what it was, and you didn't really notice either, except for you know there were some things you missed out on. I say this this is a silly analogy, um, but um, it's something I've always been conscious of. There were someone before I was talking to was from Australia Street School where where Nathan went as an infant and stuff. I've always looked out for kids who didn't have um, someone to take them to sport or what have you, and we've often, you know, had, had the troops and stuff, because I never got to play cricket, because you had to drive around. And everyone took each other's kids and took turns. But if you never had a car, you never got to do that. So you notice in a weird thing, not having a father, you missed out on some things that sort of more like when you look back at it, it's like, yeah, you know, I never got to do and, and kids would go to very much working class area camp out in those days. So when I go to the council picnic and the kids would go from the building workers picnic to there or the wharfies picnic, they'd all go to each other's kids stuff, but you missed out. Um, but, you know, you didn't think it was a big deal. Just one more question, please. When you found out that you were um, had this Italian background, how did that change you? In, in part, I think, as well, growing up, I mean, if you're... Uh, I went to St Joseph's, which was pretty Anglo, I've got to say, camping out at that time, but St Mary's Cathedral was very ethnic. There were a lot of Italian kids um, and Greek kids and Lebanese kids and... Um, so I was put with the Italian group. You know, we'd have, you know, football games, the Italians versus the Greeks or what have you. I'd be with the Italians. Uh, I'd cheer for Italy in the, in the World Cup because Australia was never there, uh, <laughs> except for 74. Um, but, you know, so you would do that. And, um, and you know, I learned to swim at Leichhardt's um, pool. And so I knew I had lots of, so I, I, I identified, but without, you know, knowing a whole lot, it was just, yeah, that was just what you were. And if you had, like a lot of kids at that time too, you know, I got called, even the, you know, you got called a wog at school. Uh, that's what happened if you had a surname ending in a vowel. Um, yeah, that was just, that was just the way that it was. So, so you, uh, you had to identify, and, and I was... You know, there's nothing that um, I was never... And one of the reasons for telling the story is that... At that well, there's a, a couple of practical things have happened. There are at least two people I know of who have found their father because of reading the story and going and searching. Right. Oh. Um, and so for, the, for that reason, you know, I think that is important and many others have felt um, better about themselves um, as well, you know. Uh, the whole term um, that's used, um, illegitimate, is a dreadful term. You know, think about what that means. It's a dreadful term to say to a child, you're illegitimate. Um, that's the respectful name that's used. Um, you know, I got to be Deputy Prime Minister. Um, you know, not bad. No. Um, so, uh, you know, to try and give people of different backgrounds can, you know, and, and for single mums out there as well, in part, the book is very much a story about my mother as much as it is about me, about, you know, women who, who give up a lot uh, for for their kids, or in, or in her case, for her kid, her child. Uh, thank you. Uh, a very touching story. Um, my question is, do you think you've been able to fathom the real depth 
the real meaning of, of having met your founding father, and also to what extent do you think, um, having found him, uh, that altered the image you had of your mother? Um, I, I think he, uh, he completed it. I certainly understood what my mother saw in my father. He's, he was uh, a very dignified man at one stage. He says that he spoke uh, half a dozen languages fluently. Um, he was hard working. Uh, he cared very much for, for his family. Um, so I think it, uh, it, it helped complete my picture of myself, but also of uh, my mother's life, what actually you know, she went through and the, the, the difficulty. I think also what I didn't want was for it to be a footnote or just a line in an article that didn't get it right, that wasn't respectful of my mother. You can imagine at the moment, at the moment with uh, what's happened with citizenship issues, <laughs> um, me trying to, in the climate of the frenzy of doing an interview, um, trying to explain what's a quite a complex story, because life is complex, it's not simple. I don't know if anyone saw the Lee Sales interview I did on the 7.30. Lee Sales was in tears. <laughs> I was in tears. Um, it was it was a really emotional thing to do. Uh, one of the things I think about um, that you get through your genes is uh, my Italianness. When we went to uh, Italy over the over the Easter, we're at this lunch at this restaurant, and and my poor son <laughs> kept saying, "Is it okay?" Because everyone was screaming. <laughs> they were just screaming. The noise, you know, you know, and, and in a language they didn't understand, and part English, part you know. Do you want the octopus? Um, you know, <laughs> and force feeding him. You know, why not? <laughs> you know. Um, so it was this. He was like, my goodness, you know, like it, it. Australian Anglo culture, or you know, the culture I grew up with, is, is very reserved. It's very, you know, people aren't, you know, and people are hugging him and kissing him, and yeah, it's very out there. Um, particularly, I think, in the South. Um, and that's a wonderful thing, and it's funny that I think I understand a little bit more about myself um, in ways that, you know, this man's DNA is in mine and it creates what you've got, um, which is someone who's, you know, a little bit loud sometimes. <laughs> um, but I, I certainly understand it more, but I'll never forget, um, I know it's a wonderful lunch with all these families, but having the best time. But if you went in there, if you took someone who wasn't familiar with sort of southern Italian culture, and took them into the restaurant, they'd say, my goodness, why is everyone fighting? <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in, um, in uh, when you first met your dad, and, and uh, he said he was quite surprised that uh, you were the Deputy Prime Minister at the time, or probably shortly well, after, after you the time, time, and then, then, then later the how did they, how did, can you talk us through how that conversation happened? I mean, you, he found out he, uh, well, he, he knew about you, but he, didn't, he had never met you or never had any contact, is that right? Yeah, or, no, yeah, no, no, no contact. So no, you had this child in another country, and here you are, you turn up, and you're also a senior minister in the federal government. How did that conversation happen? That's Very the, much yeah. Up front, so he would have been told that because I didn't want to, um, yeah, I want to make it very clear that, you know, I, I'm wealthier here than my family in Italy. So I wasn't setting up saying, you know, I'm the firstborn, here I am. Because um, <laughs> uh, that would have gone through the head. Yeah, of course it would have. <laughs> these, were, 
these were practical considerations, um, which is which is why their response was, you know, I think very very generous. You know, they made me feel very welcome. They had it, it ended up working out um, perhaps perfectly. If you're walking around Italy and you see someone with, uh, you know. Anthony Albanese Real Solutions hat or something like that. Chances are they're one of my relatives. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because for them, it's, you know, um, my father had obviously travelled a lot, but uh, his wife and the rest of my family hadn't travelled very much at all. Um, you know, it's very much, um, when I spoke to my father about, so where are your, um, parents from both sides, it was, you know, here, you know, Barletta. How about their parents? Barletta. How far does it go back? Oh, forever. You know, that's, you know, forever. Just nowhere else? Nope. Like, that's it. They asked me to you know, met Berlusconi, um, and uh, they thought that was a bit strange. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and they thought it was strange that someone could be a senior minister and walk around in, you know, you know, I haven't got a t-shirt on there, but you know, a shirt and jeans and not have security and not have... I thought I was a bit more down to earth than Italian politicians, so I guess it's fair to say. <laughs> I don't know how to say this in just a few words, but my name's first of all Dominic. How grateful we are this evening to have you amongst us to tell us your very, very touching story. I'm sure everyone in this room would uh, feel for you and what you went through when you went to start looking. I can recall first meeting you about five years ago outside in the forum in the piazza. I was then chairman of this organisation and I thought, boy, this would be just the man I should get to be one of our guest speakers. But I just didn't know how to go about it. But you caught up with me. I've got to say thank you. Miss Bikini, I have need to come along here and talk. I'm just saying on behalf of everybody here that thank you again. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you for your fascinating story and letting us share it with you tonight. On behalf of Coasset Italian Family History Group, I'd like to offer you a small <laughs> click click. You can guess what's in there. Thank you. You can share this with me. <laughs> would like to read more about Anthony's story. The book is Albanese Telling It Straight and it's available for sale tonight over there at that table. Before we close I would like to thank the Italian Family History Group Committee for helping to organise this event. Thank you also for the staff of Actors Centre Australia for helping us put on the event and thank you also to Berkeley Books, who have supplied the copies of books for sale and the staff member to sell them. Thank you to our cameraman, Jim. And thank you for Thomas for telling us all about Coazit's 50 year anniversary. One of you will take home a lucky door prize. So if you would all stand up and look under your seats, we hope that next month, October 18th, when we have Dr. Loretta Baldazar from the University of Western Australia coming from Perth to speak to us about her research into Italian migration into WA. Then on the 15th, we have committee member Antonio Luciano who will be talking about his work in films. Thank you very much for coming ladies and gentlemen.